Today what we're going over is the thermostatic expansion valve's operation and I'm going to be going over three examples of the three pressures applied on the thermostatic expansion valve. But what this is, is a metering device and it takes high pressure liquid entering it and it only allows low pressure liquid out. So it's a pressure reduction device as well as it being able to control the amount of refrigerant heading into the evaporator coil. So you gotta remember that we have heat that crosses the evaporator, and so that's in the air, so the airflow crossing the coil. And so the thermostatic expansion valve's job is to allow enough refrigerant into that coil to absorb the heat from the air. So we have three pressures that are exerted on the thermostatic expansion valve in order for it to do its job. One is the TXV bulb. As the opening force increases, it applies more pressure downwards, opening up the pathway in the middle of the TXV, allowing more refrigerant into that evaporator coil. It's also important to know that this refrigerant in the bulb is sealed off and separate from the refrigerant that's in the system. Now this refrigerant may be the same type, but it is separated and it comes with the thermostatic expansion valve when you, when you get it. So that bulb is noted as P1. Now P2, that is a closing force and that is the external equalization line, such as this one right here where you have the line tapped into the vapor tube downstream of this bulb. You can also have an internal equalization line and that would just get connected right over here to the outlet of the TXV. P3 is the spring pressure and that's a closing force. And what you need to know about the spring is as it gets compressed, it exerts more force upwards. What you need to know about the TXV is it's able to hold this little opening in equilibrium and it's able to increase the, the size of that opening and decrease the size of the opening. But what it does is it uses P1 equals P2 plus P3. So it uses that formula in order to hold that opening in equilibrium. And what this TXV is really doing, it is maintaining its superheat. So if you were to measure superheat, what you need is a pressure tap on the, the vapor line and you need a temperature on the vapor line. And so what you do is you take that temperature, which in this case, it's 48 degrees on this line, and you take a pressure reading on the vapor line. And in this case, it's 109.4 PSI. And that converts to an r 4 a saturated temperature of 36 degrees. So you take a vapor line temp of 48 minus a saturated temperature of 36 and you're left with 12 degrees of superheat. So this TXV's job is literally to hold and maintain a superheat of roughly 12 degrees on an air conditioning system. Just to tell you what superheat is, this is a saturated refrigerant right here. We have the liquid refrigerant and this small amount of vapor. It's like 80% liquid, 20% vapor. It's at 36 degrees and it maintains 36 degrees as it's traveling through the tube until it turns into a completely vapor state. Then that vapor temperature increases. So what happens is you have heat crossing this coil, but saturated refrigerant only does a phase change. It does not change in temperature. But anyway, you have 36 degrees here and it's going to increase in temperature as the vapor travels through the refrigerant tube until it comes out of the coil right over here at 48 degrees. So 48 degrees minus 36 degrees, that's 12 degrees of superheat. And superheat is the temperature increase of the vapor refrigerant. Now I'm gonna get into three scenarios where the heat load is different in all three scenarios and the TXV is still able to maintain 12 degrees of superheat. Scenario one is where you have 71 degrees of the dry bulb temperature, it's low humidity, so that's the air temperature crossing that coil. And in this case, we have a bulb temperature on the, on the vapor line of 48 degrees. If we were to take a PT chart, we take 48 degrees and we convert it to a saturated pressure of 137.5 PSI. So then we also take a external equalization pressure of 109.4. So we take 137.5 minus 109.4 and we equal 28.1 PSI as the spring pressure. Remember, we're looking at P1 equals P2 plus P3. We're able to solve that equation in order to determine what the spring pressure is. So you see this little tiny opening where the refrigerant is, is coming through the TXV. In the next two scenarios, there's gonna be a higher heat load, so the opening in the middle of the TXV is gonna be larger. Scenario two is where we have a indoor temperature of say 76 degrees. It's like a medium humidity inside the building. And what we have is a bulb temperature of 52 degrees on the vapor line. 
If we convert that to R4 to 9 saturated pressure, we have 148 PSI. Then we have an external equalization pressure of 118 PSI. So we take 148 minus 118 and we're left with 30 PSI as the spring pressure. And in this scenario, you can see that the opening is bigger and the spring is a little bit more compressed. In this case, we have to allow more refrigerant into that coil in order to handle the heat load to keep the superheat at 12 degrees. For scenario three, we have the system being turned on for the first time and it's say 84 degrees in the building, high humidity, and so you have a high heat load. In this case, we have a vapor temperature on the bulb of 56 degrees. If we convert that to a saturated pressure for R4 to 9, we have 158.8 PSI. And we have a vapor pressure on the external equalization line of 127.5, so we take 158.8 minus 127.5, and we're left with a spring pressure of 31.3 PSI. Now in this scenario, you can see that our spring is compressed even more, our opening size is even larger, so we have to allow more refrigerant into this coil, and we still have a superheat of 12 degrees. Now when you're measuring a superheat, you might find a system that has 8 degrees, or maybe it has 16 degrees. But the TXV is going to try to maintain whatever it's factory set at, and normally that's around 10 to 14 degrees for an air conditioning system. If you want to learn more about HVAC, check out our website over at acservicetech.com. Also check out our Refrigerant Charging and Service Procedures for Air Conditioning book. We have a thousand question workbook as well and quick reference cards. So we have these available over at acservicetech.com and also on Amazon. Hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech channel.